Well, hello everyone. Welcome to um, uh, today's Safe World by Design webinar, uh, where we're uh, going to address a, a new topic on the use of in silico modeling in the area of neurotoxicity. And I have with me um, uh, Sharon Bryant, and uh, we we interacted together some a few years ago um, when I used to run um, discovery informatics workshops in in Oxford. So it's it's really nice to uh, to see Sharon again, and I think she'll take us through um, what I expect will be a, a very interesting presentation of of these models uh, using the Intelligent uh, software. And then at the end, as always, um, we we can then have a discussion and, and take questions. You can put them in the the question panel and um, any at any time. Um, and I, I can also unmute anyone at the end for, for the discussion part. So meanwhile, I'm just going to leave you in the capable hands of Sharon and uh, go away. I'll come back. I'll come back at the end and um, over to you, Sharon, which for your talk. Great. Thank you so much, Barry. Thank you for this invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to connect with you again. And it's really a pleasure also, I have to say, thank you for this opportunity to share um, with everyone here um, the work that we've done on developing the neuro risk IL Profiler, uh, a tool for de-risking chemical structures for neurotoxic adverse outcomes that was developed as one of the results of the neuro risk um, project that I'll tell you about. To put this into context, it's a kind of in a drug discovery context, and, and we know already that um, the number one causes of failures of drugs are efficacy and safety. Um, and what you uh, may not be aware of already is that neurotoxic adverse effects are second only to cardiovascular adverse effects in contributing to the failure um, of, of um, uh, new chemical entities in clinical development, um, but also can result in, in the withdrawal uh, of drugs after they have been um, approved. Um, for the market. And some of the major challenges in this area of neurotoxicity is the limited efficiency of animal testing in the detection of side effects in humans. Um, and also, and this was apparent when uh, several molecules that passed um, uh, these tests um, were later um, removed for, from the market um, due to this neurotoxic adverse effects. And in particular, one uh, another effect uh, that I'd like to note are psychiatric problems, including um, depression and suicidal ideation. So the Neurodiris Consortium was formed um, to answer a call from the Innovative Medicines Initiative to address um, this this problem, this issues. And the Neurodiris um, project is a collaborative effort with diverse expertise um, from teams from the pharmaceutical industry, um, from small and medium enterprises and academic um, institutions that you see here on the right. These were the partners of this project and the idea here was to develop experimental um, um, new assays in vivo, in vitro and biomarkers but also in silico tools to address unmet needs in preclinical drug discovery um, that would significantly impact the risk of neurotoxicity in three challenging areas. And those areas are convulsant and seizure-inducing um, adverse effects, psychological and psychiatric uh, effects, and peripheral uh, neurotoxicity. So in fact, there is an unmet need um, for much earlier um, neurotoxicity risk assessment. Um, right now, the current approaches for um, risk assessment traditionally occurs later in the drug discovery process um, using low throughput resource intensive in vivo assays. Um, and these assessments do not allow sufficient time to mitigate risk by influencing uh, chemical design, which occurs much earlier in the process. And so in this project, we developed the NeuroD risk in silico toolbox to specifically address that unmet need. Um, and uh, the tools that we developed in the project 
um, comprising the InterSilico toolbox um, represented multiple applications. So we had web-based applications such as the NeuroD risk database, which stores all of the experimental and in silico data that we generated in the NeuroD risk project, and also the NeuroD risk knowledge base, which was um, already a tool that could be used to harness um, the data that we generated to understand key events and start um, assessment and understanding of adverse outcome pathways. The other tools that we developed um, could be that are you you are able to install and use um, in house um, are the neuro de-risk profiler, the Fayer's drug selection, and the neuro de-risk QFAR tools, um, and these um, can run in the NIME analytics platform. So today I'm going to focus on the development of the neuro de-risk IL profiler. Um, the neuro de-risk interligin profiler is a tool that you can use to identify chemical structures with likely risk of neurotoxic adverse outcomes and, and molecular initiating events. The idea behind the tool is to use this to support MedChem decisions related to um, neurotoxicity, so prioritizing compounds or chemical scaffolds, and most importantly, ruling out those scaffolds or compounds that are likely to fail, and doing that as early as possible in the process. So here is the NeuroD risk IL profiler as it's implemented in this NIME analytics platform, and inside this tool um, are the algorithms and the models that you need to do the predictions. Um, the input from the user is the chemical structure, and you can do that using a 2D editor, um, so drawing the chemical structures or importing them um, as smiles, smiles files, copying and pasting them into this 2D editor. Um, you can elaborate the active components of prodrugs or elaborate metabolites or um, annotate the um, uh, chiral centers because we do 3D predictions um, of, of the molecules, and you can also high throughput this. You you don't need to use the 2D editor at all. If, if you want to run thousands of uh, chemical structures, you can run this as well as a query through the um, NeuroD risk IL profiler. The results you get is um, a profile rather than a simple yes or no um, answer this molecule may have risk for a specific outcome. What you get is a profile. So across on the top, you see the chemical structures that were profiled in this example. And on, on this left side, you see the models that were chosen for profiling. And if there is an empty space here, this white, it means that the uh, ligand was not um, detected by the model. Um, but if there are colored spaces like red, orange, and yellow, this is a heat map. Red means it's strongly fitting the model that retrieved it, a yellow a little less fit, et cetera. Um, so you can get like an idea of how many um, models a, a ligand could hit and, and also a kind of connection, some information about the fit, uh, how well it matched um, the model. Now that you can also output this data um, using SDF Rider, meaning we can output the 3D confirmation that was retrieved um, by the model um, that matched the model, as well as the um, fit scores um, to the model. Um, we have also included a blood-brain barrier filter. Um, this is just a standard properties blood-brain barrier passive for standard properties for passive uptake, and you can output those molecules that match those um, passive uptake filter and the negative uptake filter. And you can put this filter before you run the profile or after you um, run the profile. So, what kind of models do we actually have inside the NeuroD Risk IL profiler? During this um, four years, we developed 63 models um, to profile chemical structures for neurotoxic adverse events, covering all of those important um, uh, uh, um, uh, outcomes uh, designated in the project. So seizure and convulsions, psychological psychiatric effects, uh, PNS neurotoxicants, um, active uptake and blood-brain barrier transport, um, and then neuropharmacology, as you know already, AMPA, NMDA receptors, GABA-A receptors, and glycine receptor, alpha-3 receptors are all strongly connected also. So it's very interesting not only to assess uh, molecules for adverse effects, but also their pharmacology. This helps us track potential, help us prioritize compounds for um, research uh, uh, related to molecular initiating events or key events or adverse outcome pathways. Um, so how do we create these models? Um, well, we use um, tools that we developed at Interligant, um, namely Ligand Scout, um, and we use them to create 3D pharmacophores. And 3D pharmacophores are abstract models 
um, representing chemical features responsible uh, for a molecular initiating event or an adverse outcome. And we can generate both structure-based uh, pharmacophore models, uh, meaning that we can use uh, macromolecular information and the interactions between the ligand and the macromolecule, but we can also use um, ligand-based pharmacophores, and in this case, the macromolecule is not used. And the question is, if a certain a set of molecules have the same um, outcomes or the same pharmacology, then they must have some um, chemical features that are in common in 3D space. And we can derive those using this um, ligand-based approach. So it means this can be target-based or adver adverse outcome-based um, approaches. Now, of course, we need to also train these models after we derive them using these approaches. So we have collected for every single outcome um, sets of true positive molecules and true negative com, uh, molecules, or we call them decoys, um, to test how well the models can distinguish between the true positives and the true negatives. And to um, prioritize models for the toolbox, we use receiver operating characteristic validation curves. So of course, there are many, many models that are generated and refined um, using our true positives and true negative data sets, but then we also prioritize the best performing models for the toolbox um, using the validation curves. So that's an overview of how we create them. And this is a little bit more about Ligand Scout, um, the tool um, that has all of the algorithms that we use for developing the model. And Ligand Scout is a, a platform that has been on the market since 2006. We started developing Ligand Scout at Interligand. And this platform is used for designing molecules and creating predictive 3D pharmacophore models for understanding structure activity relationships using these models for um, rapid and accurate virtual screening, filtering and prioritizing um, compounds, and ranking compounds for experimental assessment, and most importantly, um, ruling out compounds that are likely to fail. And this platform runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux operating systems. And so the idea of what is a pharmacophore model in Ligand Scout is it, it's an abstraction of the universal chemical features that represent a, a defined binding mode of a ligand to um, a biomolecular target um, uh, to elicit or block a biological response, and also in the case of this project, um, to look at an adverse outcome. And the kind of interactions that we can assess are electrostatic interactions like positive and negative ionizable interactions, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, aromatic interactions like pi pi stacking, cation pi, pi edge interactions hydrophobic regions, coordination to metal ions, covalent binding, and halogen bonding. So you see here on the left an example of um, uh, carosolol and the beta adrenergic receptor. This is the abstraction, these chemical features in 3D space, so these um, donors, hydrogen bond donors as vectors, and this blue star is a positive ionizable, and how we can overlay this in 2D space um, so that it's easily understandable for chemists to make decisions um, about the key interaction features and the SAR around these molecules um, based on their interaction features. So there's a lot of um, uh, articles already out about Ligand Scout. It's a highly, the algorithms are highly validated and that's one of the reasons we decided to use this technology in the, in the NeuroG Risk project. There are more than 2,900 literature articles out there covering structure-based, ligand-based, modeling, virtual screening, hit identification, um, but also um, you know, repurposing drugs for new targets, um, profiling, target prediction, and also adverse um, uh, effects or side effects, machine learning, and AI. This is an example of how we use Ligand Scout in a structure-based modeling. This is a GABA-A receptor. Um, and Ligand Scout recognizes up in the top these um, GABA orthosteric binding sites, but in the transmembrane region, in the channel region, there's picrotoxinine, which is a seizure risk molecule. And Ligand Scout can recognize these ligands um, in the macromolecule. It puts yellow boxes around them. Um, you click on the yellow box, you zoom into the binding site, and there Ligand Scout analyzes all of the chemical features of the ligand. And then it looks around in the binding site um, to identify potential binding partners. And it only adds this chemical feature to the model if there are complementary binding partners in the binding site in the correct uh, distances and, and in the correct geometry to form the interactions. So this is an example um, of how we could do that with the GABA-A receptor um, 
channel uh, structure-based model. So when we look at these um, models that are derived from these cryo-EM structures of the GABA-A receptor, you saw on the already um, the example of picrotoxanine, um, which is in the channel, which has seizure risk. But in the orthosteric site of the GABA-A receptor, um, we have GABA, which is an endogenous inhibitory neurotransmitter. And when we look at its interaction features, we can see a positive ionizable and a negative ionizable feature, this hydrogen bond donor in green and hydrogen bond acceptors in red. And when we look at the, in the same binding site, an antagonist molecule that binds there, like b for example, um, is also uh, a seizure risk molecule. Um, and it has common interactions, it's binding in the same site, so this positive ionizable and hydrogen bond acceptor, but it also has some of its own unique interactions, um, the aromatic and the hydrophobic features. And when we compare these to the picrotoxanine, the channel blocker seizure risk molecule, we can also see that there are unique chemical features in 3D space, so two hydrophobics and uh, donors and acceptors. Um, and this is the idea behind it. We can use these chemical um, 3D pharmacophore models um, to predict, make predictions about the pharmacology, but also um, the neurotoxicity. So here's some examples of um, the models that we developed for seizure risk and um, neuropharmacology um, predictions. We have 13 models um, in the NeuroD risk toolbox, um, and they encompass things like NeuroD risk um, agonists, um, NMDR. NMDA um, receptor, uh, glycine alpha, receptor alpha-3 and GABA-A channel blockers, NMDA agonist, AMPA agonist, uh, K-NATE uh, interactions with AMPA, a high-impact PAN, PAMs um, of a positive allosteric modulators of AMPA receptors are, are uh, associated and linked to seizure risk, um, and uh, glycine receptor um, antagonists um, and strychnine are also um, associated, and we can use both, um, in this case, um, both structure-based and ligand-based methodologies for developing um, those models. We also have in the toolbox models for psychological and psychiatric effects, and these include mood and cognition effects. Here we have 31 models that we developed in the project, and mood and cognition effects include things like sedation, hallucinations, euphoria, reduced cognition, mood changes like aggression, violence, suicidality and depression. Um, and so there are some obvious troublemakers that are already known if they are um, off target. So for instance, uh, GABA-A agonists, barbiturates, C drugs, they're associated with sedation, um, hallucinations and, and other types of known. And some of these are wanted effects like sedation in the case of some of the um, GABA uh, molecules. But if you're not working on uh, GABA, um, you may want to avoid um, these types of effects. Um, also, interestingly, we addressed in this project um, suicidality as uh, an important adverse outcome that I'll talk a little bit about later in the presentation. Um, for PNS neurotoxicants, we developed 16 models, um, and these models are based on the chemical structure classes of known neurotoxicants. And also, um, we have one model in the uh, neuro risk profiler um, that is related to, based on the NMDA. Uh, receptor antagonist um, FANAPEL. Um, so these um, models are useful for identifying structures with potential risk um, to injure components within um, the peripheral nervous system. So I've talked about so far um, uh, these approaches to prediction of neurotoxicity. So this target-based approach where I've given examples in the seizure risk and also a few in the mood and cognitive uh, and neuropharmacology applications, they make a lot of sense because we know the target that's a, a linked to these adverse events. Um, and we also have some conventional assays that, and assay data that we can use to directly assess um, these um, molecules and drugs that are associated with those events. But things become much more challenging when we go to the outcome-based approach. Um, and in particular, how could we address something like suicidal ideation? Um, and what we have in our hands are drugs associated with reported outcomes, so in pharmacovigilance databases. And to make things even more complicated, which is the case for all of the, the drugs in when we look at neurotoxicity, but there are a diverse group of drugs, um, not just CNS drugs, but other um, uh, uh, clinical areas. 
that are related to suicidal adverse drug events. Um, and of course, when we think about um, using pharmacovigilance data, we know that there's a high uncertainty towards causality in existing databases for suicidal um, related adverse events. Um, there's also an unknown uh, suicidality uh, mechanism of action, and we're missing conventional experimental assays when we compare um, assays that we can use for target-based approaches. We're missing those um, for suicidality. So this is extremely challenging. Um, what we did have in this project, thanks to one of the project partners, uh, I'll say Dieg, was some RNA editing data um, for creating these um, suicidal ideation models. And suicidal, uh, so what they found at Al Sadiag and Dina Weissman's group, a kind of lifelong uh, work um, dedicated um, to this topic, was that there is a link between inflammatory responses and depression and suicidal ideation. And this link has been established clinically. And that treatment of patients with interferon alpha induced suicidal behavior. And the mRNA editing profile of 5-HT2C receptors was altered in a similar way to that observed in patients treated with antipsychotics and antidepressants. Um, and so actually at uh, al Sadieg, they had developed uh, a cell test, it's called Editox, to assess the impact of drugs on RNA editing and adverse effects, in particular drug-induced uh, suicidal ideation. And so this is a, a biomarker that can detect drugs that alter the mRNA editing profile of 5-HT2 receptors in the same way as interferon alpha. And uh, in this NeuroDRIS project, in the context of our project, I'll say Dieg um, shared with us confidential data from the results of this um, Editox cell-based test um, to develop um, um, in silico models uh, for suicidal ideation. So now we have some other, uh, let's say, data <laughs> that we can use um, for uh, looking at these kinds of um, uh, neurotoxic adverse outcome. Um, but the question is, can we really identify chemical features in 3D space associated with suicidal uh, ideation induced by drugs? And in fact, if we could, the idea would be, and as we did with the PNS models and as we did in, in previous projects, um, in the ETOX project, for example, we could develop such models successfully for um, prediction of rodents and mice um, uh, carcinogenicity. Um, but the idea would be then, of course, to do multiple alignment experiments, generate uh, 3D confirmations of these uh, chemical structures, um, then uh, you know, do multiple alignment experiments um, to see if we could identify chemical features in 3D space that could be used um, to profile other molecules that could match those chemical feature in 3D space and, and indicate to us um, a potential risk um, for this type of outcome. So we can already look at a couple of examples um, to see if this makes sense. For example, Remotabont, which I circled on the first or my second slide of the presentation, a drug, a CB1, a cannabinoid 1 inverse agonist that was put on the market for um, as an anti-obesity drug. Um, it was um, withdrawn uh, by from the market by the EU in 2009 um, for risk, severe uh, psychological and psychiatric effects, including suicidal ideation. Later on, the 5-HT2C agonist, a different um, target, and another anti-obesity drug, lorcaserin, was withdrawn from the market in 2020. And when we compare the chemical structures of these drugs, we can already start to see ourselves um, some common features. Um, when we use Lick and Scout, that can really highlight those features. We can see we have these two hydrophobics, an aromatic here. We also have a halogen bond donor, another hydrophobic here, another one here, hydrogen bond donor in this position as well. So we can see, um, and it is promising, we can identify chemical features in 3D space that these molecules do have in common. Um, so we used this kind of technology um, and we looked at 1,492 drugs with suicidal annotations from um, pharmacovigilance databases like FAERS, Meta, ADEDB, and the NIH databases. And we filtered these um, databases using five terms related to suicidal ideation. Um, we used um, 
pharmacophore feature-based clustering, and we generated more than 45 ligand-based models uh, using ligand scout. Um, and then, of course, we also generated uh, separately um, these um, models, ligand-based models, using the Editox data from Alsadiag. And these um, uh, positive, the true positive data, uh, were marked unambiguous um, as having this uh, interferon alpha-like RNA editing profile. Um, after testing these models on the data sets, we prioritized um, seven models um, based on the most uh, promising results. And of course, if you have, uh, if these uh, chemical structures are detected by um, these models, um, one can also follow up um, with the Editox um, tests from Alsadiag to get further information um, about this unusual type of adverse um, outcome where there aren't um, conventional assays available. So with that, I would like to say that tools for early risk mitigation are here, um, covering seizures, convulsions, psychological and psychiatric effects, and peripheral neurosystem neurotoxicity. And we can use these tools already in this very early stage, um, you know, hit finding, hit, to, to hit expansion, um, and lead um, optimization stages um, of drug discovery. So in conclusion, um, the NeuroDRIS toolbox consists of software applications to support safety pharmacology and neurotoxicology relevant to risk of seizures, psychological, psychiatric events, and peripheral neuropathies. In particular, what I've discussed today is one of the results from um, the NeuroDRIS project. The NeuroDRIS interligand profiler provides the ability to profile and rank chemical structures for neuropharmacology and risk of adverse events using validated robust models and algorithms. It provides support for advancing research on molecular initiating events, multi-target neurotoxicity related outcomes, and nomination of drugs uh, for neuropharmacology experimental studies. Um, it provides support um, for early decision making on development and commercialization of safer pharmaceuticals and chemicals at an early stage of development, increasing the productivity and efficiency. And uh, it provides starting points for a better understanding of adverse outcome pathways and key events involving uh, neurotoxicity. With that, I'd like to acknowledge um, the team members at Interligan that were involved um, in developing the NeuroDRISC IL profiler. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the team, the NeuroD Risk Consortium team, uh, was a really tremendous effort with a lot of expertise from a lot of groups. And this project um, was led by Jacques Richard um, from Sanofi and the project coordinator Thierry Langer from the Université de Vienne, University of Vienna. And it was supported, of course, fun partially funded by the IMA, IMI and FPA um, initiatives. So these um, tools are uh, available. Um, you can contact us um, from, uh, for an evaluation and you can find information about the tools um, at the NeuroD Risk um, uh, website as well as also from our documentation um, at Interligan. So if you'd like an evaluation, you can contact us right to office at Interligan. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>